So we are going to uh, uh, discuss a phenomenon which is uh, in hydrodynamics called a surface gravity waves. And that is as good picture for this particular phenomenon, which I was able to find in the internet. And as you see, we have a rose of the elevation on the infinite, assume this was a picture of an ocean, infinite volume of the fluid. And uh, uh, if you look from a site on that picture, then we have this, this crest of the wave, and we really clearly see the a wave the structure on the surface of the water. And uh, as we yeah. shall see in our, our, as an outcome of our calculations, the liquid particles move in a circle uh, located, for example, here under the crest of the, of the wave. And let's try to analyze this phenomenon uh, using uh, those theory of hydrodynamics, which we have developed so far. And uh, this is now my sketchy drawing of what is happening here. This is the, the picture. We have a, a volume of liquid shown here as a blue picture with a certain height denoted by a little letter H. We have a coordinate system that X is in, uh, along the screen, and the Z axis is perpendicular. And of course, we have a Y axis pointing uh, outside of our picture. But we will assume that the perturbations in the liquid all depends on the, on the variable Z and the variable X. So we assume, as it was on this picture, that everything is a translation variant in a y direction. So nothing depends on the uh, coordinate on the y-axis, uh, which is perpendicular to the screen, and therefore I omitted the y-axis from all my calculation. And as we have seen on that picture, on the surface of the liquid, you have a kind of a wavy structure. And that wave structure as, uh, uh, is characterized by a length, a typical length of, uh, or a typical height of the surface of a liquid from the equilibrium position of a surface when the sea is calm and the water is simply flat as a table tennis top. So that is a characteristic length of the elevation of the surface. And the characteristic length over which this elevation changes along the x-axis, I shall denote as a, as a letter lambda. So let's, uh, let's now see what kind of an approximation we can make to describe this phenomena. You obviously see that if I would like to solve the full Euler and continuity equation for that situation, then I will run into a considerable problems. So I have to make a certain simplifications and I'm gonna make those simplification uh, justifying in what kind of a regime of those parameters, L and Lambda, my theory will be then still applicable and those approximations will also have to catch what is said as salient features of the phenomenon. So let's first recall that there is a one term in the Euler equation of motion, which is nonlinear, and this is the velocity times a uh, uh, gradient of the velocity. And I would like to drop that term. And I can only do it if it is small as compared to the derivative of a velocity with respect to time. Because these two terms combined are just this convective time derivative of a velocity. 
So they contribute to the what in the loose language I will call the acceleration of the fluid. And that I would like to be allowed to use for the acceleration only that time derivative of the velocity. So let's discuss this inequality. Uh, uh, the velocity, uh, I'm interested in the velocity of a liquid which is in the direction perpendicular to the surface. So if the time scale for the motion is of the order of a tau, then the velocity in a perpendicular motion is just the characteristic elevation L divided by that time scale tau. So I can estimate the value of a velocity in that particular phenomenon as L divided by, time, by tau. So now let's look what will be the time derivative of the velocity. Well, it will be that velocity just divided by the taus. So the order of the time derivative of a velocity with respect to time is the typical length divided by the typical time scale square. So let's look on this other term. But this other term contains two velocities and a gradient. But the gradient is in the direction along the z-axis, uh, along the x-axis. Therefore, the characteristic length over which the velocity changes along the surface, not perpendicular to the surface, is measured by that other characteristic length, length lambda. So therefore, this nonlinear term is a square of a velocity that is L divided by tau square. And that has to be divided by the characteristic scale of the gradient, which is the lambda. So this nonlinear term is of the order of R square. So if we now look at the inequality, then we can easily solve it and we found and we can find the condition that we can drop the nonlinear term in the Euler equation if the characteristic length of elevation is smaller than the characteristic length over which the velocity field changes in the x direction. As we shall see, lambda, characteristic length over which the velocity field changes along the x direction is the wavelength of the wave. So we have a very nice physical condition. Namely, we are going to study the phenomena in which the length of the wave, the distance between the crest of this wave is much larger than this elevation. So we are talking about the waves which are not too high and not too short. So that is our particular, that is the condition which we have to remember. And we drop the velocity term. So I can now use the Euler equation and because the fluid is incompressible and, and it is potential, then I can write it using a velocity potential phi. And our equation looks like this. This is a velocity square. And that obviously we can now drop out because we are using this particular condition. And what is left in this equation is the this function, thermodynamical function W, enthalpy or a chemical potential. And there is a potential of external forces. So because we are studying a fluid at a certain depth, which is supposedly on the surface of the earth, 
then the external potential we would like to include in our description is the potential of a gravity. And that is, of course, a gravity acceleration times the height z. And because of a liquid is in incompressibility, an ideal, uh, then the W is just a pressure divided by a density, and the density is constant. So therefore, our equation can be considerably simplified. And in addition, I will now consider a situation where the uh, elevation of the surface of the water will be a dynamical function. And I shall denote it as a Greek letter zeta. And it is a function of y, x along the, our ocean. And also theoretically along the y, we, if we, we will be interested in what happens when the waves can propagate in both direction. And of course, it will be the function of time. So now I can uh, uh, introduce W in the form of P over rho and rewrite the Euler equation in the following form, where the that is our term related to the, uh, to the gravity potential, where instead of z, I include a uh, zeta. So that is now our Euler equation in a very simple form. So what happens further? Uh, on, a, on a surface, the pressure must be equal to the ambient pressure. And the ambient pressure is denoted by P0. So I can use my equation in the following form. And now I can change the variables. You remember that the velocity potential was a function defined with a, up to a certain function of time. And certainly it is defined up to a certain constant term. Because a velocity, which is physical quantity, is a gradient of a phi. So when I change the variables, I change the velocity potential phi into the velocity potential phi plus p0 divided by rho, nothing changes. The velocity field, the value of velocity field does not change. This transformation is in a in the language of theoretical physics called the gauge transformation for reasons related to the science of electrodynamics. So we, we, we do that change and then our equation becomes extremely simple. Gravitation acceleration times the elongation zeta is equal to the time derivative of a velocity potential at the position z equal to zeta. Uh, that is the first term where in our analysis of a hydrodynamical problems, we encounter uh, uh, a situation where we have a boundary conditions which are moving. And that is a very common situation in all application of a hydrodynamics that we not have the boundary condition on a rigid surface. On our picture, that would be the condition on the bottom of a sea. But we have another condition, which is on the moving surface. The theory of differential equations with the moving boundary conditions leads usually to the problems in mathematics, which are called the Stefan problems. There was a physicist with name Stefan, and uh, are notoriously difficult, but 
can be either solved by a brute force or they have to be solved by a kind of a clever analysis. And the analysis which I will show you from now on is a, goes into this class of solution which shall be called clever. And it's uh, due to the uh, fundamental book on hydrodynamics written by Lev Landau. And, uh, and uh, I shall follow the Landau uh, derivative analysis in uh, our today uh, uh, lecture. So that is our one equation. And uh, because we still operate under the assumption that the typical length of elevation is smaller than lambda, then the Z component of the velocity field can be approximated just as a time derivative of the variable zeta. So the velocity of the field, which is velocity field Z component is a derivative of a velocity potential with respect to Z. So this is DZ over D phi at zeta plus a zeta prime plus a Z plus zeta dot. And if we combine these two equations, which is shown by this line, then we obtain a equation of a velocity potential, which is a derivative of a velocity potential over Z plus one over G times a second time derivative of the potential are calculated when a z variable Z is equal to zeta. So that is our equation for a uh, phi. So let's continue our analysis. This is our equation and it will be very difficult to solve if we had to follow this boundary condition when the z is equal to zeta, because we will have to evaluate in some way those derivatives on that moving surface. But because the typical elevation is small, then I can approximate that equation by assuming that I calculate those derivatives when the z is equal to when the zeta is equal to zero, because the, z, the elevation is very small, so I can take those derivatives when the zeta is equal to zero that is on a flat surface. All right, and the other equation which I have to solve is the Laplace equation for a velocity field, which comes out from the incompressibility condition which we remember, which is a divergence of a velocity field is equal to zero. So now I have a complete set of equations, Laplace equation for a velocity potential and that equation which has come out from the boundary condition. So I have these two equations which I will have to solve. And I wrote this equation on the top of the screen so we all the time can look at the, on those equations and uh, by doing the further calculations. And uh, I will now use the approximation which is called the deep water approximation. I shall assume that the height of the layer of the water is infinite. And that means that I will not be interested at all on what are the boundary condition on the bottom of the ocean or a sea or, or lake or whatever. There is no real reason to make that approximation. We could have easily assumed that the H is finite, but then we will have to fulfill the conditions, boundary conditions on the bottom of a surface and the calculations will become a little bit more complicated. Uh, and they will be full of the 
hyperbolic trigonometric functions. So uh, they will, at least at the beginning of our uh, learning of a hydrodynamics, just obscure the real beauty of the results we are aiming to have. So I make that assumption and the, I, as we said at the beginning, are now ignoring the Y dependence of a velocity potential. So everything is homogeneous in the direction perpendicular to the screen. And then the velocity potential is only the function of X, Z and time. And therefore I can look for the solutions of those two equations, assuming that the potential phi is a certain function of a height, which I denote as a capital H, times the cosine of K times X minus omega times T. I'm anticipating that there will be a wave and the wave is a periodically changing in time and space phenomenon. Therefore, it is obvious that we should look for the solution of a phi in that form. So let's see what will happen now. Let's look at the Laplacian. Laplacian is a combination, is a linear combination of a second order derivative with respect to X and with respect to Y. So if I plug that particular function phi into this differentiation, then sure enough, because I differentiate twice with respect to X, then uh, what happened? The first derivative with respect to X get me from a cosine minus sine and gets me a factor of K. And the second derivative with respect to the, cos the sine give me a cosine again, and the second derivative of K. So I obviously will have a minus K square uh, times the same function coming from differentiation with respect to X and the differentiation with respect to Z component does not touch this cosine function, it just, differentiate this function capital H and therefore the Laplace equation becomes a product of a differential equation for H times the cosine. So I can obvious, I have obviously to solve this differential equation. This is ordinary differential equation of a second order. And because of that sine minus, it is it is obvious that I should look for the solution of H, which depends on the E to the power K times Z. Sure enough, because if I twice differentiated H with respect to this Z, then I get K square, the same function Z. So K square from here and K square from here cancel, and I will satisfy the equation by the arbitrary function of that particular form. So the solution for the function phi, obeying this Laplace equation is a certain constant, which I denoted that constant H zero and um, A e to the power KZ time cosine KX minus omega T. So um, now we have to plug that solution into our second equation. And that is a very obvious calculation. Derivative with respect to Z gives us a factor of K and the derivative of time precisely like we just have discussed derivative with respect to X generate me the factor uh, omega square, so with the sine minus. So the, this equation is satisfied when the omega square is equal K times G. And that is what is called in physics dispersion 
relation. It tells us how the frequency of the wave that omega is a frequency of the propagating wave is related to the wave vector k, which is the information. And that, well, these are just the names. The wave vector k tells us how the pro, how the wave goes along the x direction. And the omega tells us how fast it changes in this direction. So that is a dispersion relation for the our equation. And we can now, using this dispersion relation in and the property of a potential, calculate the velocity field. And what you will get when you calculate the velocity field, I haven't done it. Well, you will get if derivative with respect to x, I will get the minus sign. And derivative with respect to z gives me a factor of k, similar as derivative over x, but it will not touch the cosine. So the z component will be like a cosine, and the x component of velocity will be as a sign. Well, so velocity square will not depend on the omega or k, uh, and the pen will, will be not fun function of omega because the sine square plus cosine square is equal to one, and the modulus of the velocity will be just that simple function. And if we plot the velocity, if we have the velocity, then the x component is proportional to the sine, and the y component is proportional to the cosine then we can solve the differential equation for a Lagrangian, the, the x, the position of a wave, of a fluid particle moving with that wave. And that will give us a circle, precisely that circle. So this, is, this solution is why on our first slide, I was able to draw that picture uh, uh, of the wave moving, that the particles move in a circle. All right, so if we have the omega square equal kg, then we can calculate two quantities. The first quantity is the, uh, the derivative of a frequency omega with respect to wave vector k, which is in physics, as you might have remembered from the course, is a group velocity. It tells us that if I will produce a bunch of waves uh, moving with different frequencies and different k's, then it will propagate with the velocity u, which is given by that formula. And that is a formula where the frequency is proportional to the square root of k, therefore the group velocity is inversely proportional to the wavelength, to the wave vector k. And the wave vector k is just related to the wavelength of the wave of a lambda. It is two pi over the lambda. So the group velocity for our surface gravity waves is proportional to the square root of lambda and there is a factor which depends on the gravitation acceleration divided by two pi. Interesting thing is that there is another velocity which is called the phase velocity of the wave, which is just the ratio of the frequency over the wave vector. And the, it is almost the same quantity. The difference is in a factor of one half. So the group velocity and the phase velocity are proportional to each other, and the proportionality factor is just a number. So that is the first result we obtained for a surface gravity wave. So we have succeeded in analyzing this beautiful phenomenon uh, for a deep water. So let's now look at the more physical example, which would be 
in the other limit of the phenomena we are discussing. Namely, we shall discuss a shallow water gravity wave. And a shallow water gravity wave is when the wavelength lambda is larger than the height of a layer of the liquid. Well, that is an enormously interesting physical phenomenon because it might happen on a many uh, interesting situation uh, in applied physics. For example, let's imagine that we have a channel filled with liquid uh, or a river, all right? And the river is uh, not very deep. So the height h is not very, very, very large. And we will be looking at the waves in that channel, which the length is at least comparable with the height. And in addition, we will make an assumption that the cross section of a channel, that is its shape in the direction of y is given by a certain function, we change, it, it changes, it might change in along the channel and along the time and, and the time it goes. So we, I should denote the cross section of a channel by a capital S as a function of X and time. Uh, that is a, that, this is a situation which is encountered in the, when, when we have a relatively shallow channel, which has a changing shape along it. And uh, there is at least one country where uh, there are lots of those such as channels, which have to be analyzed for a practical purposes. And that country is Holland. And uh, that is the country where this equation I already mentioned at the beginning, the Korteweg and the Vries equation describing a dissipative waves in such a shallow uh, channel have been derived. But we are now not talking still about the dissipative situation. So let's still study what happens when we have the ideal fluid in that kind of a channel. Uh, again, I will make an assumption that the velocity component of a fluid in the y direction, in the x direction along the channel is here much larger than the that the z component and the y component. So I will simplify my calculation by just denoting the x component as a velocity. So this now in this calculations, velocity is not the absolute value of a velocity, which basically is actually because if the vs, z and vy are small, then the modulus of Vx is basically the modulus of a V, but strictly speaking, I'm making a change on notation that the X component I will denote as a V. I just, otherwise our calculations will be prone to mistakes. All right, so now I can again drop the nonlinear term and the Euler equation looks like a time derivative of a velocity is equal to the pressure. If the height, that's along the x direction, because there is no force along the x direction. But what is what remains from the y component of the Euler equation? Nonlinear term is not up, is absent, and the vz is very small, so I drop the acceleration in the direction of a z-axis. And therefore, what is left from the 
Euler equation in the z direction is the one over density derivative of a pressure. This is a gradient of a pressure, and that is the gravity force. So now we have two equations here, and then I can immediately solve the, the second equation and get that the pressure is a P0 plus that expression. And uh, derivative of a time derivative. So if I plug it back to my X component of the Euler equation, then I get the blue equation. All right. So now let's happen. Let's discuss what is happening with the cross section. Well, the fluid is incompressible. So if I look at how much what fluid goes into the x direction, then a flow of the liquid, a particle current in the x direction is a difference between the surface cross section S times the velocity in the X direction at the point X plus DX minus the same product evaluated at the point X. So that is very simple definition of a derivative. So this ratio is just a derivative of a product of a cross section times the velocity along the X direction over DX times DX. But that allows me immediately to write the following equation for the in incompressible liquid, the only way how the amount of liquid going into the direction can change is if the S changes in time and basically in the vertical direction. Therefore, the time derivative of the S times dx, that is the change of the volume in time, is actually exactly this formula. So now I can drop dx and I obtain a continuity equation, if you want, for a fluid, but written in terms of the cross section x. So I have a two equation, the two blue equations. The time derivative of a velocity along the X direction is proportional to the derivative of zeta and the derivative of the cross section is given by the continuity equation. So we have these two equations and we can now proceed with the solution. Let assume that the cross section of our channel changes along the channel uh, relatively little. That means that the cross section has a certain constant value S sub zero, and it has a small addition. It changes a little bit, and uh, that a little bit is denoted by S prime. So if how the S prime can change? Well, basically by changing elevation of a liquid, the position of a surface of a fluid in the channel. Therefore, I factor out from the S prime as Z compo zeta component. And because the surface has a dimension of a meter square, then if I factor the zeta, then there will be additional, co this addition coefficient, which I denoted as a beta, must have dimension of a length. Uh, therefore, I can write that small change of the surface as a product of a beta times a zeta. And in general, the beta will be also a function of x and time. But if the change of the cross section is very small, 
then I can make a further approximation, namely I assume that the beta is constant. So now I can plug that into my continuity equation for a cross section. That is a graphic, graphic picture. This was the cross section with the surface as zero and zeta is a height and beta is basically a vertical, is horizontal direction, direction pointing out of the picture we have here. So the continuity equation is now of that form. This equation, this blue equation is of that form. And now I can differentiate it with respect to time. And if I do the differentiation with respect to time, and I use my first blue equation for a velocity, then my two equations, my two blue equation turns out to be the following equation. And that equation is uh, what we shall solve. Now, uh, the S0 is an equilibrium cross section, so to say, of the channel. This constant intersection, so it is not independent on the position x. Therefore, I can take a zero out of the differentiation, and I obtain the following equation for the elevation zeta along the x direction. Look at this. This is a second derivative with respect to time, and the second derivative with respect to the space. So I got the following equation where this coefficient g times s not divided by beta, I called uh, has a dimension of a velocity square. So I call it u and it is given by a ratio of a gravity acceleration times a equilibrium uh, average, so to say, or, or not changing cross section of a channel divided by that parameter beta. Because the S0 is in, in a meter square and beta is in a meters, then this ratio is having a dimension of a length. And if the cross section S0 was just a, a rectangular one, then that ratio will be the height. So the velocity, this coefficient u, which has again dimension of a velocity, is just a square root of a gravitational times h. So this is our, this is our uh, uh, equation. That equation, if this parameter u will be taken out of the equation, if I will change the, the, the time variable by replacing it by t times u, this will be an equation without all, without any parameters, and it will be combination of a second order derivatives with respect to time and x. It looks like a Laplace equation, but in the Laplace equation, there will be a plus here. And that is a tremendous difference in the mathematics. The Laplace equation, which was just the linear combination of the second order derivative with the plus sign, is what mathematicians called elliptic differential equation. And the equation of that form is called a wave equation, and it is a hyperbolic equation. And that equation describes a waves propagating at the constant velocity equal to u along the channel. So we have solved the problem. We have solved the problem in the form that if we have a shallow channel, then the profile of the water in the channel along the channel changes as a wave, just propagating wave with the velocity u, which we will discuss in a moment. So we have a wave equation in one space dimension. 
there is a time derivative and it is space derivative. So let's try to solve that equation. This is a differential equation, partial differential equation. So hopefully we can solve it. All right. And I proceed with the solution in the following way. I change variables, variable x and time. I change these variables in the following form. I use two new variables, x minus u times t and x plus u times t. The first variable will be denoted as x psi and the second will be denoted by a eta. So now I have to calculate calculate the change of variables in the derivatives. I have to replace derivative with respect to time and x by the derivative with respect to psi and eta. This is what you should try to do by yourself. And the result is extremely simple. Namely, I will get the second derivative of zeta with respect to psi with respect to eta. That is a three line calculation. So it's very simple. D over dx is D over psi, D over psi, psi over x, and D over eta over, uh, over I mean, this convention, so I, I don't need to discuss. So this is a, the second order derivative. And now, of course, I can solve it. I can immediately solve it, integrating with respect to the psi variable. If I integrate that with respect to psi, I get that the first derivative of zeta with respect to eta is equal f with the index zero times as a, as a function of eta, because this the derivative of that with respect to psi is zero. So that is the first step in my solution. And then I integrate that with respect to eta. So if I integrate that with respect to eta, then I have to integrate that function f0. And the integration of that function f0, I will denote f2. But there is also a constant here with respect to eta, which is an arbitrary function of, of a variable psi. So the general solution of that equation is a function of, is an arbitrary function f1 of a variable psi and an arbitrary function f2 as a function of eta. The solution of a wave equation in a one dimension is a sum of two arbitrary functions, one which depends on psi and psi is x minus ut. So in the old variables, the general solution for a one dimension wave equation is an arbitrary function of x minus ut plus an arbitrary function of x plus ut. But because of that dependence of the variables x and t, we see that in the frame of coordinates, which moves with the velocity u in the direction of x, this term is constant. So the f1 stays constant in the, when we move forward. f2 move is constant in the frame which moves backward. So these are the waves moving forward along this x direction. And these are the waves which are moving backward in time. So we can depict that in a drawing, which is a four dimensional, in a which is a two dimensional space time drawing. We consider a plane with x and t direction. Vertical axis is a time and the horizontal axis is x. Then the line of a constant psi and constant eta 
are those red lines. One is a, one is the CT and the other is minus CT. And our functions F1 and F2 are constant on that, on those red lines. The important thing is that on that two dimensional plane, which is a caricature of a space time in contemporary physics, everything lives within those crossed red lines, which divide the space time into the future and the past. And uh, this is just to show you that already in the hydrodynamics, the, this concept that the space and time should include in it a, a particular geometric structure, which there is related to the propagating of electromagnetic waves with the velocity C, which is then the velocity of light. And I, uh, well, actually should be you here, I'm sorry. I just copied that drawing from my, my lectures on electrodynamics a few years ago, so I'm sorry. That should be you, all right? Because in our equation, there is you. So that is, this is the fact that the, that the fundamental equation of electrodynamics, when there are no sources, is the wave equation, is uh, responsible for this particular drawing, which I'm sure you have seen many times on your lecture of special relativity or electrodynamics. So we have shown that the, there are waves propagating in a shallow channel, and that allow us to refresh our memory about the solutions of the, of the uh, wave equation in one dimension. In more dimension, that construction is incorrect, but there are other ways of solving the wave equation in three dimension. And uh, you have certainly have seen those solutions in the course of electrodynamics, and perhaps we will encounter it later on in our, on our meetings. All right. So here it is already the correct way that u square times square t square x square is constant. So this is this. Uh, if I differentiate it, that will be give me the equation of a light cone in electrodynamics or this cone in the in the hydrodynamics and there are also some names associated with it like a, like a Riemann lines and so forth, but we will not discuss it. Uh, it will take us too far. So that was everything about the shallow water in the channel when it was not dissipated. But here is a, a certain information which was collected in 1834 by a Scottish uh, ship engineer, John Scott Russell, who had been taking a horse ride in the morning along one of the channels or little rivers next to Edinburgh in England, uh, in Scotland, I should say. And uh, he observed uh, people drawing a barge over that channel. And that is the uh, a fundamental text written, as I said, in 1834. Uh, I was observing the motion of a boat, which was rapidly drawn along a narrow channel by a pair of horses, when the boat suddenly stopped. Not so the mass of the water in the channel, which it had to put in motion. It accumulated round the prow of the vessel in a state of violent agitation. Then suddenly 
leaving it behind, rolled forward with a great velocity, assuming to the form of a large solitary elevation, a rounded, smooth, and well-defined heap of water, which continued its course along the channel, apparently without change of a form or diminution of a speed. It followed, I followed it on a horseback and overtook it still rolling on the rate of some eight or nine miles an hour, preserving its original figure some 30 feet long and a foot to a foot and a half in height. It has gradually diminished and after a chase of one of two miles, I lost it in the windings of the channel. Mr. Scott Russell had discovered that if you have a shallow channel of a water, which of course is dissipative, then when you push it very fast, then you create a heap of water which propagates in the channel with, without changing either its shape or its speed. And that was the first discovery of a phenomenon which is in various branches of physics called differently. For example, in a hydrodynamics, it's called tsunami. On the ocean, if there was a suddenly a a phenomenon which pushes rapidly and fast a huge mass of water in one particular direction. For example, the earthquake that can create the hip of a water on the ocean, which moves with a tremendous speed and without changing shape and height all over the ocean. And that is a phenomenon which is called in the oceanography a uh, tsunami. In physics, it is called a solitary wave or a soliton in contemporary language. And for quite a long time, there was a quarrel between distinguished hydrodynamicians like Mr. Stocks and others. What, what, what is the origin of that? For we, we just have shown that if I have a shallow channel, I have the waves, but how those waves can all of a sudden change into that heap of water which propagates without changing the velocity. And uh, that was solved at the end of the 19th century by a Dutch physicist, Kortebeck, and his student, De Vries, who were able to derive the equation describing dissipative waves in a channel of shallow water. And they have shown explicitly that there is a solution of that equation, which is in the form of a, 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 a not changing in space and time, a profile which moves along the X direction with the peculiar property that the speed with which it moves is proportion to the height of that, uh, of that profile. And uh, uh, we, when we will be eventually true with the dissipative equations of a hydrodynamics, and when we also introduce a concept of a surface tension in our analysis, then we will discuss very briefly the Kortevec de Vries equation. But that is a point to mention that I took the liberty to bother you with the shallow water solution for a channel because it's the beginning of the analysis of the most in one of the most important concepts in contemporary physics which is called a uh, solitary waves or solitons and what is associated with it is a uh, uh, theory of chaos uh, the solitons those waves have their sister namely they have the sister uh, uh, excitations, which are also some kind of a waves, but these are the waves which propagates when we do not linearize Euler equation. Uh, we got our nonlinear, we, we got our linear wave equation by making all sorts of approximation that the velocity and elongation is small. Well, that is not necessary. We can relax those. Uh, 
approximations and uh, still able to solve the equation, the Kortevec de Vries equation, and find out that it has a soliton solution, but it also has a wave equation, wave solutions. And these waves are called knoidal waves. And uh, you, can, uh, you can much easier see the knoidal waves when you are on a beach. Uh, and uh, if, if you see how the crest of the waves collapses into a smaller ripples, which propagates in the water, this is a, a real world collapse of the, what happens with the knoidal waves in the, in the, in the channel. All right, so that was about the shallow channel. And then I will uh, try to discuss at the end the, uh, 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 the first and the only for a while, a situation where we have the uh, uh, non-homogeneous system in which the waves are propagated. And, uh, Obviously, the, the water, when it's uh, under the application of a gravity, uh, is not of the same density all over the depth of the water. And uh, the fact that it is inhomogeneous and its thermodynamical consequences of this inhomogeneity uh, results in the very peculiar phenomenon, namely that if I have an incompressible liquid, then, but inhomogeneous, then the, there are particular, peculiar internal waves which can propagate in incompressible liquid. And uh, this is related to the fact that if I have the inhomogeneous liquid, there is this gravitational field denoted here as a red arrow pointing towards. Then the whole system is still adiabatic. That is a conventive term derivative of the entropy is zero. But that does not mean that locally entropy cannot change because if the, there is any kind of a motion, a small motion of a liquid in a z direction against the gravitation field, then it results in the local change of a density of the liquid. And the local change of the density of the liquid through the thermodynamical relation causes a change of the entropy. It is a local change of the entropy, the global Entropy is the global situation is still adiabatic, but locally the entropy can change. So we will still discuss the linear waves. That is, uh, the nonlinear term in Euler equation will be small as related to the time derivative of a velocity. And we will consider a situation where we have a small change of entropy with respect to equilibrium value, which I denoted as sub zero. Now, this is not the intersection, it's entropy. And I denoted it as an entropy, uh, as a function, uh, as a little s. But the entropy along the z direction, which is vertical direction on my drawing, is a function of z. In order to keep everything adiabatic, I might have a local fluctuation of entropy denoted as a prime, but the, a profile of a density as not might also change along the z direction. So if I plug it in into the continuity equation for entropy, assumption of adiabaticity, that is the convective time derivative of entropy is equal to zero, that results in the following equation that the time derivative of S prime is a velocity field times the gradient of S zero. If that S zero will be constant, then this term will drop out. And I will just have a trivial situation 
that the time derivative of entropy fluctuation is zero. So that would mean that the total entropy is constant and we will be back in our analysis as which we just have finished. So we make this assumption that S zero, the profile is uh, Z dependent is of great importance. So now let me write the equation of motion. This is the Euler equation. And that equation is, uh, is written here. And uh, I missed the G here. The time derivative of velocity is one over rho del gradient of pressure plus uh, gravity acceleration. And I calculate that derivative. This is one over equilibrium density times the gradient of a pressure fluctuation plus one over rho square rho prime times a gradient of a dense of a pressure profile because if the entropy has a profile, then the pressure also changes in the, in the water. We know that the density changes, so it also changes the pressure. So this is our equation. And uh, the, uh, uh, what is the fluctuation of a density? The fluctuation of a density according to the thermodynamics is a derivative of the density prof bare profile over the S naught at the constant pressure. You might remember from a thermodynamics that if they calculate the derivative, we have to denote it what variables is held constant by calculating those derivatives. So this is the derivative of a rho naught with respect to S naught at the constant pressure times the fluctuation of the entropy. And we know that the divergence of the velocity is equal to zero because the liquid is incompressible. So we will now look up for the situation where the velocity is changing as a wave. So I will look for the velocity times a certain constant, capital C, times e to the power i, this is a minus, the square root of minus one, times kr minus omega t. I could have written here a cosine function or a sine function, but it is much more convenient to use the complex notation, remembering that the physical velocity will be a real part of that result, whatever result we will obtain. So now I substitute this assumption about the velocity into the incompressibility condition. And that would result in the condition that the wave vector K times scalar product with the velocity is equal to zero. So that means that the velocity vector and the wave vector K have to be perpendicular to each other. So if the velocity points in one direction, the, the K might, must point into the perpendicular direction. So now we have the same situation. We have the assumption about the velocity that it is a wave. Then we, incompressibility condition means that the K times V is equal to zero. And I will also make an assumption that the fluctuation of the entropy is proportional to the e to the power i omega t. So now we have the following graphical situation. We have our gravitation field red g and the wave vector k is in some direction. So the angle between the vector k and g, I shall denote as a capital uh, or small letter theta. And I also make an assumption that the entropy profile is along the z direction. So the, gra nabla, the gradient of S0 
is proportional to the derivative of a zero with respect to Z component. All right. So this is my continuity equation for entropy. And this is my velocity. This is my Euler equation. And now I multiply it by a, in a scalar way by the wave vector k. Why I do it? Because then this term drops out by the incompressibility condition. If I do this, then I have a very simple relation for the fluctuation of a pressure P prime. Well, I said that the wave vector K is forming angle theta with the gravitational acceleration. So the scalar product GK, which pops out here, is just the wavelength, uh, the length of the wave vector K times a gravitation acceleration times a cosine of that angle. So if I now plug it back to this equation, I solve it for omega and the frequency omega square is given by that complicated expression, which contains the angle theta and the bare entropy profile. Let's see what we can draw out from this complicated expression. From that expression, we look at the thermodynamical equilibrium when the temperature of the liquid is constant. When the temperature is constant, then I can use the thermodynamic relation. The entropy derivative with respect to Z component is a derivative of entropy with respect to pressure at constant temperature times a pressure derivative with respect to Z. This is a chain rule of differentiation. And I know what is dP over dZ is minus P times G. So this is my one thermodynamic equation. And the other is, which comes out from the thermodynamic identities, that the entropy with respect to, derivative of entropy with respect to pressure at constant temperature is one over rho square derivative of a density with respect to temperature at constant pressure. And derivative of a pressure with respect to entropy at constant pressure is a T over a CP and the derivative of rho at, with respect to P at constant pressure. And coefficient CP is the specific heat at constant pressure. That is how how much heat we have to add to the system to increase the, temp the temperature of that liquid by one degree uh, at constant pressure. And T is an absolute temperature. These are thermodynamical identities. They are in every textbook on thermodynamic. So I can plug this to that expression and the frequency omega turns out to be G times sine T and a square root of T times CP. And that is of course, when I use to simplify because it will be a complicated expression. So I simplify it, making assumption that the equation between pressure and the density and temperature is a ideal gas expression. So I calculate that for the ideal gas. And as you see, there are waves propagating in the liquid and they propagate at a certain angle to the gravity. There will be no wave propagating strictly perpendicular. So in the inhomogeneous liquid, we might have the internal waves, although the liquid is incompressible, but those waves cannot propagate strictly vertical. They have to propagate at the constant angle. This internal waves, as I have learned from literature, 
are of uh, some importance in constructing the uh, devices which record the motion of the um, submarines. Because if the submarines moves, it makes a noise and it, uh, the noise of the engine or in, can be silent by using a very complicated hydraulic construction, how the propellers or the submarines are built and so forth. But when it moves, it creates these internal waves and these internal waves are somehow detectable by um, modern devices which detect the changes in the, the, the waves moving in a liquid, something which is a contemporary form of the device known from the second world, which was called Asdai. So that is apparently what is now also being used. So these are the internal waves in incompressible liquid. And we are now uh, basically finished with the uh, with the ideal liquid theory. And our next step will be, uh, will be discussion of the dissipative processes in the liquid. And the most fundamental of those phenomenon is viscosity. And I will devote it the remaining few minutes of our today lecture to the discussing with you a phenomenological of the viscosity. So to recapitulate it, we have been discussing how the hydrodynamics so far, how the hydrodynamics have come out from the microscopic physics. We discussed the ideal fluid, which was in no, no dissipation phenomena happen. And we discussed uh, properties of the particular ideal fluid, which was incompressible. And we solve many applications. And as you have seen, those applications are of importance because it is important how the body moves in a liquid. And of course, everything which we said so far will have to be reanalyzed when a dissipation phenomena are included because the waves will be damped and the motion of the body will also be affected by the fact that the viscosity provides an additional damping phenomenon for the motion, not a sheer mechanical resistance that if the body moves in the liquid, it has to push the liquid in the front of it and it has to, and that liquid has to fill the void behind the moving body. So there is this D'Alembert paradox and so forth, but if there is a dissipation, then all of that will be behaving very differently. And uh, so we first have to learn what is the viscosity. And the experiment, the viscosity is something which you know very well. I mean, if you, if you open up a bottle of, a, of a mineral water and you want to fill up the glass, it goes very fast. But if you will take a, a, a jar of a honey and turn it upside down to fill up the, another jar with the honey, then you will see that the flow of the honey from the upper jar to the lower jar is completely different than the flow of the water, mineral water. And the phenomenon which is responsible for the difference in this uh, observable easily situation is uh, viscosity. And the simple experiment to discover the viscosity is shown on that picture. We have a container which is with the liquid and we try to move the upper layer of that liquid homogeneously in some direction uh, by applying a certain force F. And experiment tell us that the velocity profile for the water will be as this one, which is shown on a drawing. 
So if the direction vertical is Y and the along is X, that is what I think I have in my drawing, the changes of a velocity of a fluid will be going down, down, down to zero and will be strict to zero on the bottom layer when the bottom is a rigid wall of the container. So we will, that is what we will be able to discover in the laboratory when we will take uh, water and put on top of the water a thin layer, the thin wire box, a square made of wire attached dynamometer, which is a device to measure force to that little square and pull the, this wire loop over on the surface, it will drag the layer of the water with it and we can measure this uh, profile. Today, of course, this is very easy. We do this and we shine the light and we can use the uh, uh, laser light to have a beautiful projection of the velocity profile. And uh, the same happened when I take a cylinder and I start to rotate the water within a cylinder and you will see that the water moves differently on a, in the middle of the cylinder than on the, on the walls. This is actually a, a phenomenon which uh, makes my life miserable at a certain point uh, when we had the uh, when we had a martial law in Poland in uh, 20th century, in the 80s, there was a shortage of uh, essentially everything, including a shortage of uh, butter. But on a farmer's market, it was possible to buy us a cream. So since I had the theory that it is easy to make a butter out of that cream, I bought a sufficient amount of cream and I decided to make a butter. And while I knew that the butter is produced by a shaking the, the sour cream, so I, I decided to be a smarter and instead of shaking it, I used, the, I used a, a centrifuge to do this. And all of a sudden, all my sour cream pop out from the container and end up on the, on the ceiling of my, our kitchen. And I will restrain myself for telling what was my wife's comments on this piece of experimentation, experimental physics I did at home. Anyway, that is the phenomenon that the density, that the velocity profile changes in such a situation is called viscosity. And experimentally, we can discover that there is a relation between that force which pulls the top layer of the liquid and the change of a velocity in the y direction. So if the velocity change in the y direction is the ratio, a change of a velocity per unit of the y axis, then the experimental relation is that the force F is proportional to that change of a velocity of the y direction the area of the fluid, and there is a coefficient there, which is basically necessary in order to convert this dimension number. Area is a meter square, velocity is a meter, and that is a meter. So this is a meter square, so it has to convert a something which is only a meters and time into the unit of a force, Newton. So that must be a dimension coefficient and that coefficient is called a viscosity coefficient. And we can easily see what is a dimension of that coefficient. It is a force divided by area divided by the velocity change of light, which is a gradient of a velocity. So the 
force over the area is a mass divided by a length. And that is proportional to the inverse time. So the unit of eta is a kilogram times a meter to the minus third time a second. And the unit uh, is called the poise, one over P. And the one of a poise is uh, 0.3 pascals times a second. Because if we convert that into the pascals, we will get this expression. So that is the unit in which the viscosity is being measured. And that is the uh, a, a table which I collected for you. This is the value of the viscosity coefficient in a Pascal's time second for various substances at the various temperatures. So for example, the castor oil is having a huge viscosity, as you see. It's of the order of a one, while the viscosity of a water is a 1,000 of it. And the viscosity of air is one of a 10,000 of the viscosity of a castor oil. And the viscosity of a fluid, which is of a great importance in our everyday life, that is, blood, that is blood, is of the viscosity is basically similar to, to water. So uh, the final drawing is this one. For you remember the Bernoulli law, that if you have a pipe through which the liquid is flowing, then when the cross section is changing, then the velocity in the narrower channel is larger than in the bigger channel. And the pressure drops because the sum of a pressure times square of a velocity plus a square of a velocity is basically constant. So Bernoulli law tell us that the velocity changes like this, but the pressure is changing as shown in the upper part of the drawing. Here it's higher, here it's lower. But if the fluid is viscose, then the fluid stops on the boundary and there is a change. Namely, this, this drawing is having a slight, so don't look at this end of it. It's, it, it's a mistake of, of my making uh, combined slide from two slides. And uh, then the velocity in the uh, narrower channel is lower than in the thicker channel. And the pressure is anyway dropping along the flow. So the, what the velocity, the pressure drops is shown by this lines and the velocity satisfied that condition. So now our, uh, we, we, we shall be thinking about how to describe that situation and incorporate those experimental properties in our hydrodynamic equations. And uh, uh, the one of the problems which we first, I mean, next week will solve uh, to get ourselves a certain feeling, what we have to incorporate into the hydrodynamic equation will be analysis of a flow of a viscose liquid through a pipe where uh, the pipe has the same area. So it is uh, just a pipe with the same cross section all over. And it will have a different pressure at the opening of the pipe and on the, its end. And it will have a certain length. And we will cal try calculate how much liquid, viscose liquid will go. 
If this was ideal liquid, the problem will be automatically solved because as much we know exactly, it will be the same amount of liquid which goes in, it will goes out and there will be no point in asking the question as much as the liquid we could have pushed through the pipe, then it will come out from the other side. But if the liquid is viscous and it has to satisfy the viscosity boundary condition on the surface of a container, the result will be completely, completely different. And we will be discussing that next week. So see you then tomorrow. Thanks you with, for being with me. We shall see us tomorrow and have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye.